Are you working in a nonprofit, but having to work extra jobs just to make ends meet? Do you want to make a difference in the world, but are completely burnt out from overwork and underpayment? Do you wish you could leverage your passions to change the world, but on your own terms, having the flexibility to travel and make the money you are looking to make? This is the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. We are building a network of global activists and empowering you to have the freedom to have a thriving business, making an impact in the world without burnout. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. My guest today is Laura Hartley. She is an activist, writer, and coach. She's also the founder of an online school for activists and change makers with programs in healing burnout culture, starting purpose-driven initiatives, unlearning perfectionism, and doing the inner work of dismantling capitalism and supremacy culture. Laura, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Tiffany. I'm so happy to be here. Can you tell us, um, I think I really cookie cuttered up your bio and shortened it a little bit, but again, I always say no one wants to hear from me. They want to hear from you. So can you tell us your story and what launched you into this space? Absolutely. So I always say that my work is born out of three passions that coalesce around one question, which is how do we create the conditions for social healing and collective thriving? How do we create both a business and a world that we love? And so these three passions um, really inform all that I do. And the first of these is outer change. So I am a climate and environmental activist. I really, I care deeply about reimagining the systems we live in. You know, capitalism is the leading driver of the climate crisis. And so part of my role in being an activist, I think, is to imagine new futures, new structures, new ways of being. But I'm also really passionate about our inner worlds. So I grew up in a family that was surrounded by personal growth. My mother uh, founded one of the first life coach training schools in Australia, like many decades ago now. And some of my earliest memories are like sitting in the car and listening to uh, Neil Donald Walsh or Wayne Dyer or Tony Robbins. And I had no choice. And I absolutely hated it at the time when I was like seven years old. But, you know, this, this magic or this wonder about inner worlds now, interior conditions really has stuck with me to this day. What does it mean to be human? How do we create meaning? And then my third passion is, of course, business. You know, I love business and I think business is an incredibly powerful tool for change. And that's at every level, whether it's like solopreneurs, whether it's big corporates, um, it has this incredible capacity to change the world. But if business is going to do that, I also think we need to change the way that we do business. We need to look at the way that business participates in systems like capitalism or other systems of oppression and really actively work to uproot it. So these three conditions or these three passions have really led to the school that I run, which is a school for change makers, where there's programs in building a business beyond capitalism, uh, healing burnout, as you mentioned, unlearning perfectionism, and really this inner work that we need to do to create the new structures in the world. Oh, that's fantastic. And you you mentioned your passion for business. And of course, you mentioned your passion for activism. I mean, this is a huge driving force in your life. But you talk on your website about how business can be activism. Can you explain what that looks like? Because this can seem very much like contradictory terms. So how can business itself be activism? Absolutely. Well, You know, I think when we first think about that term, we tend to go to really tokenistic methods that exist, you know, like a lot of the the greenwashing that's happening and, you know, like, look, we're eco-friendly or we're sustainable or we support this movement or Black Lives Matter or whatever it might be. And they'll put up an Instagram post, but really do absolutely nothing to change the culture of the company. And that's not activism. That's not true activism. Business as activism is about really reimagining our role in systems as business owners. So there's a lot of different ways that this can happen, but I'll bring it back to the main area that I talk about, which is capitalism. You know, capitalism is founded on two principles. And the first of them is the pursuit of infinite growth on a finite planet. And the second is this production of scarcity. And both of these 
systems are things that we can really learn to step out of within our business. We can learn to redefine success. We can learn to take it beyond the triple bottom line to actually what is a much more holistic method of measuring the qualitative, measuring the relational and not just the transactional or the numbers. We can look at the way scarcity shows up in our mindset, in our marketing is a big one, uh, in our money, in the way that we charge people. You know, have we provided accessible options? Have we acknowledged that not everybody comes from the same uh, background with the same opportunities to create wealth, with the same mindsets, the same uh, tangible opportunities to create generational wealth? How are we creating those opportunities? We can look at our hiring practices and our marketing. You know, so often our marketing, we unintentionally market like ourselves and we don't include true diversity. We, we, it's not really conscious. Um, it's more a very unconscious thing that we tend to just do things that look like us. But when we start to put all of these things together of really reimagining our participation in a system, so we're looking at, well, how do I measure success? What would my business be like if, if growth wasn't my only metric of success? If profit wasn't my only metric of success? What would it be like if I were to unravel scarcity from my business, from my marketing tactics, from assuming that, you know, we very often use marketing that's quite sleazy or embedded within scarcity or lack. Like if you don't buy now, then you will miss out when that is absolutely not true. And how do we instead embed it on regenerative principles and a more holistic measure of what we're doing? Yeah. When you, there's that buy now, <laughs> I, I understand because I always say like, you can take all the, the business courses you want until you do the inner work. Like you're not going to achieve what you're hoping to achieve. You're not going to get to that next level. And so I, um, you know, started all the business courses because I was like, Oh, this is why I'm failing at all my other entrepreneurial ventures. Cause that's what I'm missing. And so like, I understand the the psychology and a little bit of the neuro linguistic programming that's um, behind that, but that just gives me such anxiety. And I, it's like, I, I, I understand again, like the, the, the mindset behind why the marketing is the way it is. But like, for me, I'm somebody, and I feel like this is a lot with, and, and tell me how this resonates with you. Like, I feel like a lot of us activists can just see right through that. And I think because there's a lot of, uh, um, I mean, you have to, as an activist, have a really high level of empathy and being able to read people. So we can just see through the nonsense and just be like, no, I'm dealing with that. I mean, that's not how you market to me. Like that, that's not going to get me to buy. So it has like the absolute opposite effect. Absolutely. Like completely like activists and anyone in the kind of change sphere. So whether it's like nonprofits, whether it's more community organizing, whether uh, it's social entrepreneurs, they are often so easily able to see through this, you know, and it, I actually think most people can as well, because it's very disingenuous. It's, you know, it's based in this lack, it's based in this not enoughness. It's based in this idea that we need to constantly be doing or saying or getting or receiving more, you know, we need to kind of keep up and grow. And none of that is true. And so there's no real solid foundations to that message. And instead, like if we actually really look at what is genuine relational marketing, genuine authenticity, a genuine connection with the people that we want to serve, because business ultimately should be about service. It should be about vocation. It should be an expression of our gifts, of our talents, of our interests. Then there's a very different space from which we start to work from. And in that space, I think there's that real capacity for change because we're actually connecting with people. We're not just, you know, selling a, a product for the sake of it. We're not just doing it to make money. This is business with purpose. And it's business with a more holistic sense of what is really important to us and what is the world that we want to create. Yes, absolutely. You've talked about internalized um, capitalism well, you talked about capitalism, but there's also a big pillar, I think, in 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 your your business about internalized capitalism. Um, and you know, you were talking about the infinite growth on a finite planet, and I think there's that scarcity mindset um, for for money, but for the um, the the finiteness, I think a lot of the times people will trade their time for their money, and um, so I mean. 
time is what's truly finite. It's money that's not. Can you talk a little bit about internalized capitalism and just the issues around people's concept of time? Because especially when there is more of a scarcity mindset and I just don't have enough for you know, whatever you're trying to spend on, I'll go the very long route and <laughs> trade my time instead when that is truly what is finite. Yes, absolutely. The first thing I want to address here is that, you know, we are the system. It is so easy as change makers that we see the system as something outside of us. And to an extent it is, but it's also created by humans. It is perpetuated by humans, it's upheld by humans. You know, this is not something that exists in the natural world. It is something that we created and that we participate in. And then very often what happens is we internalize these systems. So internalized capitalism is really just the equation of our worth with our productivity or our worth with what we produce. So as we said, like capitalism measures or it values this, um, this constant growth, this endless production, this always upward trajectory that you know, never quite ends. And when we internalize that, we start uh, disconnecting from our body we start disconnecting from our natural resources, from our inner wisdom, and we kind of start working in a way that is very extractive. Now, internalized capitalism shows up in so many different ways. Some of the most common ones are, you know, you're going to work when you're sick, like especially like pre-COVID, like this was so common or even during COVID, like how many people had COVID or were genuinely sick and were still just working from home? Um, the feeling that you can never switch off or that feeling of being a little bit guilty when you rest, like you need to be doing this thing or you need to get this next thing done. Or like even listening to this podcast right now, how many people feel that they need to be doing something else at the same time. And of course, internalized capitalism also shows up in time scarcity, which is what you were saying before. So embedded within capitalism is this production of scarcity. And we internalize that in our relationship to time, you know, how often have you caught yourself saying things like, there's just not enough hours in the day. I can't fit it all in. We're running out of time. Change isn't happening fast enough. Or, and it, like, I'm very guilty of this, being in a workshop or something, and you're like, okay, we have like a lot to fit in today. So we're just going to like pack a little bit more in and squeeze a bit more in. You know, we're going to power through lunch. And of course, all of this is like embedded in like, this experience of time scarcity. And a lot of us, and this includes myself, experience it to such a degree day to day that we're quite unaware that our time isn't scarce. Our time, it has limitations. And I do agree with the point that, you know, ultimately you have a limited amount of days, you have a limited amount of weeks left on this planet. That is an absolute given. But we have more of it in our moment-to-moment experience than we recognize. And when we allow ourselves to slow down and we allow ourselves that reconnection with our body so that we're not just operating from this place of needing to produce, needing to, to extract from myself, needing to be at a certain level in order to be worthy, to be good enough, to belong, whatever it might be, then it gives us a, very, a much more imaginative sphere to work from uh, a much more holistic sphere and a much more regenerative undertaking or foundation to our work. One of the things that I think that people will, they'll hear that these type of messages and you had said that you grew up on Neil Donald Walsh and Tony Robbins, and even like listening to this podcast or other podcasts I've had, or just reading certain books, people will be like, oh, that, that sounds nice, but that's super esoteric. And that's not, I want a practical guide. I want to, oh, here it is. It's the, the quick fix. And it, as you were saying, change isn't happening fast enough. I knew I, my thought was going to come back around, <laughs> but it's really <laughs> change isn't happening fast enough. That's not what's going to actually fix it. That's so nice for you to say, because you've hit these certain markers. I'm not there yet. You know, this whole idea of, you know, slowing down or gratitude, or again, these, all these esoteric comments um, or esoteric thoughts and not like, that's not actually going to fix it. I, I want the quick pill. I want, I want the, I forgot the matrix is the blue pill. I want, or the, <laughs> I want the one that's going to fix everything right now. Not like this, you know, um, fluffiness. Can you address this and how, um, 
it's not, I mean, because I, I think you understand what I'm talking about. There's people that are just like, that's nice, but that's not, that's not where I am right now. Can you really address the importance of slowing down and the importance of all of this? Oh my gosh. I mean, first of all, like, don't we wish that pill was actually real? Like that you could just like take a pill and like yeah. sort everything so quickly and take the quick fix. Cause like, I wish it existed, but it doesn't. Or the idea of just, you know, we have to grind it out. We have to just sit and focus and just hustle, 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 push, 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 push. Yeah. You know, I think the, you know, I think it's important. First of all, there is a quote by Bayoa Komalafe, who's a writer that I really admire. And he says, these times are urgent, we must slow down. And I think there's an important message in that, that sometimes understanding that many of the crises we face are urgent. They are incredibly urgent. Um, you know, as a climate environmental activist, I am so aware of that. But urgency doesn't always mean working faster. Sometimes it means working differently. It means working slower. And ultimately, if we want to create the change, and that's change in the world or change in our own lives, then we need to take the time to understand the conditions that have brought us here in the first place. So a lot of what this hustle culture, a lot of this grind, and this is like so common in movement spheres, in nonprofit spheres, this idea that you just need to like endlessly be working and that one day you're going to reach this place where it's all done and you're just like there. And I wish you did. I, I spent a long time myself trying to get there and it does not exist. We need to look at where that comes from. And that's really just such a product of the culture that we're living in. It's not actually grounded in any truth. It's not necessarily grounded in our well-being. And so what is most important to us here? Where is our value system? Is our value system simply producing more, doing more, impacting more, changing more, this endless quest for more? Or can we stop and pause for a moment and start to understand what it is like to be satiated? what it's like to be satisfied. You know, I always say that capitalism doesn't know what it is to be satisfied. It doesn't know how to be satiated. And very often we don't either, you know, whether that's with uh, tendencies to overeat or to drink too much or to overwork, whatever it might be, we, we've lost this capacity to be satisfied. And the only way to do that is to return to the slowing down. It's to return to the body. It's to return to its natural wisdom. And then to look at what that is actually offering us to work in a way that is more reflective of nature, more reflective of cycles, more reflective of seasons. And when we can do this, it just gives us such a wider space to work out what our work here is on this planet. You know, I think I think when we're so conditioned to hustle culture, we're so conditioned to always needing to do or be more that we also disconnect ourselves from what is true for us, from where we're being called, from where our passions, where our skills, where our talents really lie. And it requires that slowing down to listen. Yeah. And capitalism thrives on us not being satisfied because if we were satisfied, if we were fully satiated, then we wouldn't buy more. And so our culture perpetuates this, perpetuates this void. I was listening to something um, and I can't even remember what it was on now, but it was looking at marketing and um, just unpacking the way that, um, ads are portrayed for the consumer. And so it will show an image of something that we innately want as humans. So it'll be a happy family picnicking. And then all of a sudden you see this soft drink or you see something that has nothing to do with that, but you're just automatically pulled in because there's this hole inside of you that you want to have filled in it, whether that be the family or just, you know, the idea of happiness or whatever it is. Uh, Coca-Cola is so good at this. Yes, they are. That, did you notice how I said soft drink? <laughs> exactly. And so they'll just sneak in this product and you think, oh, and on some level, you're like, oh, okay, well, that's going to give me that. But it's not. It's, it's just the way that it's being marketed. And again, like you're not going to buy stuff if you think you're you know, completely 
happy and whole as your own. You're not going to buy that wrinkle cream. I mean, this happens all the time in women's products. You know, you're not going to buy all that stuff if you think that you're beautiful just as you are. You're not going to cover up the grays. You're not going to do all that stuff. Exactly. And, you know, I, I completely agree with you there. But this is also where I think it's really important to make the distinction because so many of us are already aware of this, right? We already know that capitalism might be problematic. We know that these things are marketed in really unethical ways. And so, of course, when we're starting a business, we're thinking, well, I don't, I don't want to be part of that. That's, that's not a system that I want to be a part of. And this is where it's kind of really important to make the distinction that business is not capitalism. Money is not capitalism. They're actually very distinct things. And business has predated capitalism. You know, it's really just this system of trade, of bartering, of goods and services that has existed throughout all of time. It is a way to share um, your gifts, your talents. It's a way to be compensated for your labor. And what capitalism is, is a system that we unconsciously and consciously sometimes participate in as business owners. And it's really business as activism is really about looking at what those threads are. Where are all those different threads of capitalism coming into business? Where are all those different threads of patriarchy coming into business? And what would it mean to untangle my business from them? So that my business was really founded on purpose-driven mission, that it was really about helping and serving other people, that it was really about marketing and selling in a way that was in authentic alignment, and that it was really based on vocation, on my inner callings, and this, you know, a new form of leadership for the world. So it's, it's untangling all of these strands, all of these webs of the systems that we're looking to change very often in nonprofit spheres or very often as activists from the way that we're working, from the way our business is structured. And it's not that they're actually the same thing. And this is why I think business can be so powerful because the more of us who learn to do business differently, the more of us who learn to work in a different way, to provide opportunities, ways to sell, ways to market, ways to make money, uh, ways to employ people, ways to build community that are not steeped in these systems, then the more we are actually birthing this new experience in the world and these new conditions that we would like to have. That's fantastic. Now, how do we do it? How do we do it individually? And how do we do this collectively? How do we start to untangle these webs of the system? Oh, gosh, that's such a good question. You know, I think this will be different for everyone. I think it's start where you are. I really believe that. And I really believe it's also that now is the time. Too often, we, we put things off that we want to do, whether it's start a business, whether it's invest in something, whether it's change career, whether it's deal with our burnout, because now is not the time. You know, we've got to get all these things first, but now is the time. There, there is no other time but now. And if you're waiting for a sign, like, this is it. Um, and then it's really starting to break down. Okay, well, you know, from a personal perspective, what is it that I'm wanting right now? Is it, am I wanting to work on my business? And if so, okay, what's the difference here between capitalism and business? How do I start to think about where I might participate in it? You can have a look out there for different programs. There's some amazing ones out there. If it's personal, like burnout is a big one, like just those points that you reach when you have nothing left to give anymore. And it's really starting to examine, do I want to be a part of a system that makes me feel this way? And as much as we think that the system isn't something we can opt out of, we can radically challenge our participation in the system. We have more agency than we think. We have more power than we think. And when we start to just be open to those ideas, to have the willingness that maybe, maybe there's more possibility here than I think. Maybe if I just start to realize that I don't know how, and that's okay, but I believe there's a way, or I'm open to there being a way. I'm willing to consider that there's a way and starting to see what emerges. You know, these changes and this work isn't something that we do overnight. It's not a quick fix. It's not something as simple as, you know, saying a few affirmations or or just starting to meditate. It's really slower, relational, grounded work that is returning to what is natural, returning to what is real, returning to what is organic. And that's just 
learning how to work with what we feel, learning how to work with the world, learning to trust ourselves again in, in a world where we've been told not to. I think that's so huge. Being open to there being a way and, and having that silence and, and listening, but being able to trust because I think that so often, and we were talking offline about this, about how there's, um, um, you know, I, I believe that when we tend to get called towards this type of work, there's a reason and there's um, extra layers that we need to unpack. I mean, all it's a human condition that we all have stuff um, of just fear of, are we good enough? Um, all these type of things. But when you're going into this type of nonprofit NGO activism, change making, there's um, specific reasons why we were called to this work. And a lot of the time it's personal experience and there's extra trauma. And when there's that extra level of trauma, there can be, can I trust myself? And really navigating that. So how and I know you've talked about slowing down, but can you give any other um, advice for those that are just scared to trust themselves because they feel like they've been let down, not only by others, but by themselves and just the thought process of, well, you know, I got myself in this situation or I stayed in this situation or, you know, those types of things. And trust is so huge to getting to whatever the next level of your vision of success is, how do we start to really lean in and start to trust ourselves again? Yeah, I, I think we start with trusting the body, not the mind. And, you know, I want to put a big disclaimer at the beginning of this, that anyone who has experienced significant trauma um, will very often have you know, experiences in their body that make it very difficult to lean back into and to trust and should probably have a professional that can help them work with that. I think that's really important when there has been trauma. But for a lot of us, you know, even with burnout um, or most of us in our society, we're just so incredibly disconnected from our body. You know, we live very neck up. And when we do this, we miss its natural signs. We miss its rhythms. We miss what it is asking of us. You know, there's a wonderful quote by uh, Clarissa Pinkola Estes, and I'm probably going to get part of this wrong, but she says that the body is a multilingual being and it speaks through feelings and sensations. It speaks through, you know, the pit at the stomach, the rising lump in the throat, the heat of anger, the, that rush of love. You know, so there's all of these sensations that are speaking to us all of the time. But very often, we don't use them as our baseline for whether we should do something, whether we should say yes, whether we should say no, whether this is truly for us or not. We, we often don't even notice that they're there. At least that was me for a long time. Or we just kind of skip over them and we go to our thoughts or our beliefs. Now, you know, if we have beliefs in there, like, that we've held on to for a long time that says that there's not enough resources, you need to work harder, or you know, you're only going to be loved if you do this, or all these like million and one shoulds that we all carry around, all of these beliefs that just, you know, say that oh, to be a good partner, to be a good wife, to be a good mother, to be a good activist, to be a good daughter, to be a good change maker, whatever it might be, I need to do X, Y, or Z. If you're listening to those beliefs in your mind, you can't trust them and they will override your body every time but your body doesn't lie. You know, if you can reconnect to what it is telling you, it's a very different sphere. So as an example, I recently, I had a friend who was doing, asked for a call out to help with newsletters, some flyer dropping for a new movement that was happening. And I thought, yeah, sure. No worries. I can help. You know, I, I love to help out. I feel like I've been a bit out of the scene. It's good to like get out there. I'll do some exercise with it. And before long, you know, this opportunity where I thought I just agreed to like maybe like drop some flies around for an hour or two turned out to be this mammoth thing with like four hour rosters and shifts where I had to turn up at a specific time and I, I could have a buddy system and it was just absolutely immense. And my body was just, my mind was saying, oh, you said, yes, you have to do this. You agreed, you committed, you know, you have to show up. My body was just like, oh, hell no. It was, it was closed. Yeah. It was heavy. It was weighed down. My shoulders hurt because I had like this weight on them. 
And I really listened to that. I listened to that as my guide. And that's where I learned to say no to that. I learned, even though I agreed respectfully, it wasn't what I thought it was. I don't have the capacity. I need to back out. That was my wisdom. But if I had listened to my mind and I'd like, like, oh, trust myself. I said, yes. And, you know, my thought says, yes, I can do it. I have time. I can make time. I'm efficient. I would have regretted it. And I would have ended up very stressed and on the path to burnout as so many of us do. And you're worthy of trusting yourself and your body and your internal voice. And you're able to do that. And no is a complete sentence. You don't need to elaborate. I mean, it's it's obviously you have to explain why. Hey, <laughs> in your situation, I'm so sorry. That's that's a little bit different. <laughs> but that's the thing. I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. I did agree. I apologize. But actually, I'm at my capacity and I need to step back. And we need to make step back culture okay. We need to make step back culture okay in business. We need to make it okay in nonprofits. It is okay to say no, to change your mind, to, to recognize you're at your limit. Because every time we ignore it, we're just moving further and further down this burnout chain, further and further away from what is true for us. And of course, it's harder to trust ourselves because it, why would we? we? You know, we listen to our mind, we listen to our thoughts, and we ended up stressed and burnt out and unhappy. So. It's that returning to a different space that we're learning to trust. And I think that's important. Absolutely. Laura, thank you so much for all the fantastic work you're doing. All of your links will be in the show notes. And seriously, the world needs to hear this message because not enough people are talking about this. Not enough people are part of this conversation. So thank you for doing everything that you're doing in the world. Oh, thank you so much. And right back at you, Tiffany. Like, I am so excited to listen to this podcast and all of your episodes. I think it's so wonderful. And thank you to everyone who was listening today as well. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. To stay up to date and receive free, valuable resources and action guides, you can find us at humanitarian-entrepreneur.com.